Welcome back. I'm Joshua Santora, coming to you from near the Kennedy Space Center. When I left you last time, I thought we would be in full swing of launch preparation, but we've had a couple delays, and so we figured we'd take time to hit another episode in our series of how the NASA's Kennedy Space Center is enabling deep space human exploration. Today we're going to hit on Gateway and how our commercial collaborations and partnerships are helping us explore and even pioneer new worlds. Gateway, in short, is an outpost that will be orbiting the moon that will enable us to reach a variety of locations on the moon's surface, as well as travel to Mars and other deep space destinations. It is a multi-center effort, and the Kennedy Space Center has been given the responsibility of the logistics element. So to learn more about what that is and what's involved with making logistics happen, I'm joined now by Jeff Smith, who is the element architect for deep space logistics. Jeff, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How about you, Josh? Thanks. Yeah, I'm doing really well. Uh, always excited to talk about Gateway. It's, it's one of those projects where every time I talk to somebody about it, I feel like I'm learning so much more. So excited to hear from you. Tell us more about your specific role with Gateway. The, the Deep Space Logistics architect uh, looks forward at what are the crew and the cargo needs going to be in the next three years, the next five years, the next 15 years. It's my job to try to understand all of that and then boil it down into something real and implementable that we can go do. I mentioned a minute ago that this is a multi-center effort and Kennedy has a piece of that. Uh, can you unpack for me a little bit more? Uh, what is this logistics element and Kennedy's role in making that happen? Yeah, the, the logistics element is one of the modules of Gateway, one of the parts of Gateway. Gateway uh, in its very early phases will have a power and propulsion element uh, and a uh, halo element, a uh, habitation and logistics outpost element, does two small parts. Only the halo element actually could have people in it. Uh, Orion will dock there, the human lander system will dock there, and a logistics vehicle will dock there. That's where we come in. Uh, so the, the logistics vehicle, this, this Dragon XL, in this case, uh, our first contractor and partner to be able to uh, fly to the gateway, uh, that vehicle, you know, it really doesn't look like the, the Dragon 2 capsule that just brought crew back successfully from the ISS. But under the hood, it's all the same, only with a couple of little tweaks and a much bigger section for putting cargo in there. Jeff, just listening to you today, I think I had an aha moment. I've been envisioning this as a one-time, uh, one-and-done uh, situation, uh, but it sounds like that's not the case, that this is actually a recurring mission. Is that true? It is a, a, a recurring set of missions. And we're nominally expecting maybe one mission per year uh, over the lifetime of Gateway. Uh, the, the vehicle will be loaded with over 5,000 kilograms of cargo and supplies and experiments and, and other types of things. It will go up autonomously docked to the Gateway. Uh, then it will stay there for up to one year while the crew come and uh, do their sorties to the lunar surface or another work that they have to do. After the crew have left, uh, the trash will, be, will have been loaded into the Dragon XL. And on a, in an autonomous fashion, Dragon XL will depart and then go into a disposal orbit, probably somewhere you know going around the sun, uh, where it will be safe and, and not uh, interfere with other missions. As the series suggests, and as NASA missions are clear, uh, the moon is not the final destination, although it's really important. We're headed to places further, Mars and beyond. Uh, so how is Gateway enabling that sort of exploration beyond the moon? Uh, this is going to be the proving ground, you know, where we've gone from ISS and low Earth orbit, where we're only just a few hours away from help should we need it. Uh, we're moving out to Gateway here, um, you know, 240,000 miles from Earth, several days journey to get there or to get home if something, uh, something needs to, to be done. Uh, Gateway is going to really increase the level of independence that the crew need to have in order to do the operations uh, in this remote environment with longer and longer time delays between Earth and Gateway and then eventually Earth and Mars communication. Gateway is going to be the proving ground for all of that. And then when we do need to start moving on to Mars, Gateway is a great staging point. It really doesn't take a lot of energy for a vehicle that's docked at Gateway to then boost itself into an orbit that can take it all the way to Mars, a Mars transit orbit. So Gateway is going to stay a part of our program for a long time as that staging point, that hopping off point to Mars. Jeff, can't thank you enough. I appreciate you being here. Uh, good luck to you and the entire team. I know there are some very fun and exciting but very busy years ahead of you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Great to talk with you. 
there's no mystery that we're relying heavily on SpaceX and the Dragon XL to make the logistics element for Gateway happen, uh, but they are far from the only company that is helping support our exploration efforts. To unpack more about the, the broad look at commercialization and exploration, I'm joined now by Mary Fowler, who is a senior mission manager with the Launch Services Program, and they call the Kennedy Space Center home. Mary, thanks for joining me. Absolutely. Mary, looking at the past of kind of the way NASA's done business with our big space programs, we have done a lot of dictating to contractors for things like the space shuttle. Uh, we're working, uh, we're owning this process, but now we're shifting gears and this commercialization really means that we are operating like a partner. Um, can you tell me more about the changing landscape and what that means for us? Well, so NASA LSP, we've actually been doing this for over 20 years. Um, launch vehicles have been launching commercial for decades, obviously. So, uh, you know, historically, we NASA bought hardware. Uh, they owned everything. They owned it from the design. They owned how to build it. Uh, but now we're transitioning into buying just a service. So we just say, we need to go up into this orbit get us there. I don't care how you do it. Just make sure it's safe. And so we don't own all of the interim steps. And now we just have targeted insight into what the contractor's doing so we can knowledgeably agree with what they're doing. And then we have also very targeted approvals, kind of in those very high risk areas or mission unique areas and allows for a lean team and allows for the industry to really innovate for us. So stepping back and understanding where we can take a little bit more hands-off approach has really allowed the significant cost savings and more emissions to actually go forward rather than just a handful of really exquisite, expensive missions. Yeah, thank, thanks for um, kind of talking about some of those benefits there. I appreciate that. Obviously important to talk about those, but I'm guessing that it's also brought some new challenges with it. So where are the growing pains for us and what are some of the challenges with this new operating model where ultimately we're relying more on commercial companies. So it's really a cultural shift for most of NASA. Um, trusting the industry to do the right thing is always hard because NASA does it pretty darn good. Um, so allowing the ownership of those items to reside with industry and letting go and of the telling them how to go do everything versus a more commercial approach of focusing on what we really need to be delivered and in the end, not a step-by-step -step approach of focusing on um, how they need to get there, right? We just need what they are gonna provide. Also, commercial entities, they are now responsible for the mission success. Um, it will be perceived that NASA has a failure if there's a failure, even if that responsibility uh, lies with the contractor. So that's really needing to manage expectations of the public and you know, everybody else who thinks that this belongs to NASA and you need to own it. That's the challenge. Last big question for you today. Is this something we can expect to become a staple? Like, is this the model going forward where we'll see broad partnerships and collaborations for human exploration? So really as the commercial companies, they see the benefit of commercially exploring space, the industry base, the customer base grows. Um, there's real excitement of pushing humans beyond low Earth orbit, going to the moon, going to the gateway, going to Mars. Um, so that's going to continue as that industry grows. There's no going back. It's just a much more efficient and effective way of doing things. Mary, a big thanks to you for your insight and expertise and taking time to talk to us. Um, obviously, Launch Services Program has a huge part to play in the robotic explorers that will be a part of our sustained presence on the moon and beyond. Um, so good luck to you and your entire team. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. All right, that's going to do it for us here today. Uh, now we think we're going to take that break for these amazing launches coming up. Specifically, the two that are the most noteworthy are the Crew-1 launch from the Kennedy Space Center and the Sentinel-6 Michael Freilich mission from California. Um, so please check those out, nasa.gov, for more information on those. Another big thanks to Jeff and Mary for their help today. And remember that even the sky isn't the limit.